Welcome back to day two of the GSV Leaders Summit. Uh, I hate to stop everybody from talking because we love everybody talking. Um, I'm not sure we're going to be able to top the dinner last night. Uh, we're going to have to search very hard for a venue of equal stature um, for our next go round, but, um, but we'll see how we do. Anyway, I'm, I'm thrilled to uh, be able to announce our first um, discussion between Lara Zero from um, uh, University of Pennsylvania, where she runs the People Analytics Group, as well as puts on a um, fantastic, serious radio show, Women at Work, um, where apparently she, she actually interviewed me. Apparently, it's being replayed today for anyone who wants to, to hear the podcast replayed. And um, I'm delighted to introduce Katie Burke, who is the Chief People Officer of of HubSpot and, uh, and, a, and a complete rock star in the world of chief talent leaders. So um, we're thrilled to have her here today to talk with Laura. So come on up, ladies. Is this on? Oh, it is on. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us this morning, Deborah. Thank you for the introduction. So, Katie, in the bio that we have in the book, you can all see it, there's a particular line in it that gets my attention, that you are overseeing a global employment brand, yet you're the chief people officer. This sounds very marketing. Talk to me about, is that on purpose, and how these two things come together. Uh, so good morning. It is indeed on purpose. Uh, so I'm a former marketer. I attended MIT Sloan, so this is coming back home for me. The facilities were not quite as nice when I spent my time here, um, but it's always nice to be back. Uh, but I had no intention of ever becoming a chief people officer. Uh, I thought that HR was uh, not where the action was, and I'm a person who runs on adrenaline, and it turns out I was wrong, as many of the people in this room know. Uh, luckily, I've learned the error of my ways, but I was in marketing. I ran uh, communications internally and externally for HubSpot's initial public offering. And as we were prepping for the IPO, we were talking to bankers and lawyers, and one of the things we really, we have aspirations to be a company that's around for decades. And so we looked a lot at companies we admired, but we also looked at companies who failed. So we looked at companies who failed after their IPO to become the company they wanted to become for many years after. And we asked founders and entrepreneurs and employees of those companies, what happened, what went wrong? And we sort of were trying to do an autopsy of companies that didn't make it. And the cause of death was the same for every single one. It was culture. Every single one just said, you came in and it felt different and something changed and the people we hired weren't as hungry and it didn't feel as fun to come to work. And I left the second that happened. Um, and so we noticed a common theme that instead of focusing on financials, uh, investors were asking us increasingly about our team, how we gel, what we do, how we hire, how we plan to grow after our IPO. And it got all of us thinking. We had always been a company that cared about culture, but it got us thinking, if we're going to succeed, this might be the single most important thing we do. Uh, and so Dharmesh Shah, who's one of our co-founders, is a really unassuming, humble guy. And he never asked for anything. And the day after we IPO'd, he asked me to have lunch. And he said, I think you should take over our culture full time. And I said, that sounds like a great way to be unemployed, because who has a culture <laughs> team? Who's going to hire me after HubSpot? No offense, I love uh, HubSpot, but this just feels like a short stint and a really good way to shortchange my career. And so I said no, uh, foolishly, which shows you how good my judgment is. Um, and I said no thought about it the next day, and basically went back to him and said, I will take it. Here are the things that I think we should do if we're really going to invest in this. Uh, and so I've been running our culture ever since. That was 2014. Um, in 2016, I took over our entire people operations team, so overseeing learning and development and talent and recruiting and all that kind of good stuff. And it's been an amazing journey. To your, to your original question as it relates to a global employment brand, one of the questions I get a lot is people ask if we try and make everything the same. So do we try and make our culture the same for every team, for every location? And what I always say to people is we're looking to create uh, siblings, not twins. So when you walk into a HubSpot office or with HubSpot teams, there should be certain things that are non-negotiable. Our commitment to transparency and autonomy and empathy should be completely non-negotiable. But the traditions that make an office tick, the things that our external leaders bring to the offices they run or the teams that they run, uh, those should be uniquely them and we explicitly want them to keep it that way. And so I run a global employment brand, but I'm as proud of the local traditions and cultures that each of our teams and locations has as I am of our global commitment to some of the things we really care about. So Katie, it's interesting the way that you're, you first reacted. 
to that idea about culture. And I've heard it from people I've talked with since I'm here, and I hear it all the time. A uh, kind of dubiousness that culture is something that can be measured, developed, um, transmitted to others. So talk to me about how you took your doubt and started to operate with it or despite it and got to a place where you can now say we, our culture is a real thing. Uh, so the way that I think about it is when you're building a great product, your rhetoric needs to match your reality. So what people are buying needs to match what you deliver. The same is true of culture. So we were very fortunate. Our culture code has been viewed now over three and a half million times. So we had great marketing. We had this you know, brand that people gravitated towards. And so where, what I set out to do when I first started the job was to close the gap between who we said we were and who we, wa who we actually were when people came in the door. Uh, and so I started as... Uh, any good MIT grad would with the data. Um, and so I was very lucky. We do a quarterly survey of our employees anonymously every single quarter and have since 2010. So I had a lot of data to work with. Um, and so you can imagine I worked with key themes. One of the things I looked at was themes that hadn't changed over time. So where are people the most frustrated because we haven't made progress? Um, and I dove in there. The other thing that I looked for is um, paper cuts. So as you scale and grow as a company, there are little tiny things that just cause people to really, it really grinds their gears. So an example is uh, one of my colleagues, um, we created, as all companies do when they go public, seemingly well-intentioned policies on things like postage. So we've all been at work at some point and you're like, oh, I have to mail this stupid thing and I can't get to the post office, whatever. And so one of my colleagues was looking to send out his daughter's birth certificate for you know, a passport or something similar. And the person at the front desk told him, one of our executives, we're so sorry, we have a new policy that you know, we don't hand out postage for personal mail. And you can imagine I got like 17 emails about it and he was like, this is the end of an era and all that kind of stuff. And so one of the other things I look to do is soften the edges on paper cuts. So I tried to fix really big things where we were falling short and then really small things that really send a signal to people that we are no longer the company you're going to be. And it turns out to do that, you have to hire people from hospitality. So one of the things that I do is I hire people with traditional HR backgrounds. I hire people with marketing backgrounds, particularly given mine or business backgrounds. We make sure we have the business acumen. But I also hire very heavily from hospitality because they are the group of people that understands paper cuts and their associated pain better than anyone else. Okay, I, I have two tracks that I want to go here. So I'm just going to note this. So you can all hold me accountable so we go down both of them. One of them is what you do with hospitality. I'm going to come back to it, though, because this term, paper cuts, I first heard it when Michelle Obama was talking about the thousand paper cuts that women experience, particularly women of color, when um, they're interacting in the world that is insensitive um, not aware of their subconscious biases and the various barriers that they encounter all day, every single day. And when you have thousands of paper cuts, you can imagine what that does to, pe to people. I know one of the things that you are proud of is the way that you've advanced diversity and inclusion at HubSpot. Talk to me about how you've done that, how you learned to see it, and what you did first. Yeah, so I'm beyond proud, and one of the things I would say is we have made a ton of progress. We still have a long ways to go. So when I took over culture, 20% uh, of our managers and up were women, which is actually roughly in line with most of tech, I'm embarrassed to say. Uh, and to date, 45% uh, of our managers and up are women, and of our vice presidents, 47% are women. And so we really made a huge impact on making HubSpot a best place to work for women. And what we did on that front was two things. Uh, so one... When we IPO'd as a company, there were two women on the platform. Uh, my dear friend Allison was on the other side, and she was expecting her first son, Bennett. Uh, and so she and I had dinner two nights before the IPO, and one of the things we talked about was I was like, how cool is it that your son is going to be up on the IPO platform with us and was part of this? And she said, I know, but wouldn't it be cooler if we created an environment where every parent at HubSpot, including dads, by the way, dads get left out of this conversation a lot, that we really moved the needle on this. And so we made a commitment to each other that night that we were going to do it. We were just going to figure out a way to do it. And so we've done a lot of big things, and then we've done a lot of small things. Uh, so one of the things that we did was um, we adopted the Rooney Rule, which comes from the NFL, uh, for any director level role and up. And so you have to, at HubSpot, interview a, either a woman or an underrepresented ethnic minority for every manager role and up. It's now actually down to the manager level. Uh, and then the other thing that we did was we started writing a lot more content about the experience of women. So again, one of the things we noticed is, well, two things we noticed. 
Uh, women, as a rule, are more risk averse in making career changes. So often women wait until they are incredibly frustrated to make a jump. And so one of the things we want to do is early on nurture people who are thinking about making a jump to m help them consider that HubSpot was the place long before they were ready. And then the second thing is women look at the data for sure, but they want to hear about personal experiences of people like them. And so we celebrate International Women's Day. We do external events. We focus on getting more women on boards and do panels on that. We actually want women, when they enter HubSpot in entry-level roles, to be thinking about board jobs. We want aspiration to be part of their expectation and part of their daily rhetoric versus something that comes later in their career. Because uh, we see confidence, as you know, just really dissipates with women in the workforce over time. Um, and then we've also done small things. We have. We increased our parental leave policy. We totally revamped our mother's room. So mother's rooms are a good example of paper cuts. Um, so for example, we used to have ones that were totally compliant. They weren't warm. Yeah, they were technically compliant. When you're nursing, you don't want to be technically compliant. You want to be comfortable. And as it turns out, it's time consuming. It's personal. It's you know all these different things. And so we revamped our mother's room. We revamped uh, our like the ways in which we talked about performance reviews. We uh, revamped pay equity and how we thought about it. So now, when you make a recommendation for our annual compensation review, you have to look toggle on a gender tab. So you're thinking about it regardless of whether you're male and female. What are the recommendations I'm making, and what are the implications long-term for pay equity at HubSpot. So all of those are big and little things that we've done to change the narrative. But I think one of the other things we've done is we've asked our leaders to be vulnerable around their positions around diversity and inclusion. So uh, Dharmesh Shah talked about feeling different as an entrepreneur and how he dealt with his Indian accent as he was growing up um, as an entrepreneur. Our uh, COO, JD, grew up in the Deep South and talked about the first time that he realized that race mattered. And as it turns out, people don't expect perfection when it comes to diversity. They expect you to try, they expect you to be vulnerable, and they expect you to be human. And so we've really made an effort as a leadership team to not have all the answers, but instead to talk about our personal perspectives and how we got there to invite a conversation with our employees and candidates on how we can do better. Which is really the key way that you move from having diversity in a room to making it an inclusive room that comes with that respect. Absolutely. So it also sounds like that original question I asked about a global employment brand, it has power beyond just making it evident that HubSpot's an attractive place to work. It's actually a tool to send message to talent that they should start to aspire in a bigger and grander way. Absolutely, and I think that's, I think you picked up on something really important, which is when people talk about the global employment brand, it starts with the premise that people should love where they work. And as it turns out, people's expectations of the workforce are relatively low, which is really sad. And so one of the things, the reason we use Net Promoter Score to measure employee happiness is because when you ask people about work at a cocktail party, you usually get two answers. Uh, how's work going? It's either busy or good. It's an end of a conversation. It's a period, not an ellipsis. And so what we want to do instead is go, if you meet a HubSpot employee in the wild, which I hope you do, um, my hope is that they would say to you, if you ask how work is, oh, let me tell you about what I'm working on. Let me tell you about my colleagues. Let me tell you about my peers. Let me tell you what I'm most proud of. That's our standard. And the reason that's our standard is not just because we make a commitment to it as a business, it's because unemployment, frankly, is at record lows. And so you have an obligation to do more than just check the box. You have an obligation. Top talent is not sitting around wondering, hmm, how could I you know, come to your average workplace? And the same thing, we really believe that the best people in the world don't want to be micromanaged. And so as a result, we have to do a lot of work with our managers to go, if you want to attract great people like Laura, you can't be over her shoulder telling her what to do so how do you create a lot of space where she can do amazing work and figure out solutions that we may not otherwise have figured out? And so part of what I'm always reminding our leaders is this isn't my initiative. This isn't a people operations initiative. This is an initiative because we believe fundamentally that talent is the reason we're going to win or lose. And talent is not just a recruiting strategy. It's a retention strategy. We are only as successful as the great people, not just that we get in the door, but that we keep and grow. So tell me about how you're using data to inform all of this, because you're doing a lot more than simply thinking about the pipeline. It, granted, you're doing great work, and how do you get a more diverse, more talented population to join, stay, succeed, and lead within the organization? But how are you using data and this role, this powerful role of chief people officer in tactical terms to help people manage better, create better dynamics in the conference room, and not just on their way in the door? 
So on the data front, I mentioned our, our ENPS uh, scores, so that's Employee Net Promoter Scores. We have that historical data, um, but as everyone in this room knows, HR surveys are historically where good information goes to die. <laughs> Um, you know, when I worked at a big consulting firm, you'd take the survey, two years later, they would come out with the results of the survey, which basically says, like, everything's wonderful, everything's perfect, and oh, by the way, we're going to have, like, a rubber chicken breakfast to celebrate how happy our employees are. You don't feel heard, you don't feel welcomed, you don't feel included, and you certainly don't feel like anyone lost any sleep changing anything because of your feedback. Uh, and so one of the things we do at HubSpot that's a little bit unique is all of the raw comments and data get shared with everyone in the entire organization, every single one. The only thing that gets redacted is you are not allowed to slander another frontline employee. Uh, you are actually allowed to slander our management team. So I publish comments all the time that say, I think Katie did a, did a terrible presentation. Those are not enjoyable days, but they're important because of our commitment to transparency. And one of the things I have an obligation to prove to our team is this isn't filtered. This isn't filtered based on my experience or what I would like it to say. Um, it's, it's raw, it's for everyone to read. And so part of what we see happen in companies as they scale is a tendency for leaders to solve for themselves or to solve for their own teams. The transparency of the data we collect is a huge part of our forcing function to go, you can't hide from employee feedback. Um, and oh, by the way, we don't want to. And so part of what we say to leaders when they come on board is we do this survey Here's what's going to happen. You're going to get team data. And does that excite you? And for the right people to be leaders at HubSpot, they're like, yes, I would love to have that data and that level of feedback. If someone goes, oh, I would want to see that. I'd want to edit it. I'd want to publish it. They're probably not the right fit for our culture of transparency. Um, other data that we look at, um, we look at everything from employee retention to time and role to, as we think about diversity, one of the things we notice is um, the hiring rate for passive candidates versus referrals. So as everyone in this room knows, referrals have negative implications for they're less expensive and they often get hired more quickly, uh, but they're less likely to be diverse in every way, gender, race, uh, sexual orientation, you name it. And so we also look really deep in that weeds on data like that. And one of the things we've added is nudges within our systems to help make sure that passive candidates who don't have the benefit of an employee nagging someone or recruiter to say, hey, pay attention to Laura, uh, get the same attention as a referral would, and so we're trying to think about every element of that data and how we create nudges in our systems to make everything more fair and equitable across the board. I want to back up to the transparency thing, because, you know, we've heard about other organizations that have a kind of radical transparency, and while it does hold senior management accountable, it can also contribute to cruel behavior Agreed. and creating a culture that allows radical candor to be productive and compassionate at the same time is its own challenge. How are you navigating that? Uh, so I actually, I feel bad for Kim Scott because I think some of her work has been weaponized and I think that's unfair to her and the great work right, that she's done. Right, because it's deeply compassionate. Agreed. Her approach to radical candor, I think, is at its core very deeply empathetic. And I think when people hear radical candor, they view it as uh, the opportunity to be as cruel and uh, direct as they view and acceptable and unfiltered. Uh, we view it exactly the opposite. So one of the things that I always say to people when they try and rely on transparency as a reason for being able to give people uh, unfiltered feedback that is not, in fact, uh, kind or helpful, is one of our other values very intentionally to offset that is empathy. Um, and so our, our, the E in our heart actually used to be effective. And as we scaled globally, we very intentionally made that switch. And it was partially to make sure that everything that we do at HubSpot has a lens of empathy. And as you know, the world of tech has been mired in controversy where empathy has been a missing ingredient. And that includes everything. Empathy for our customers, empathy for our partners. When you're reaching out to our partners and our customers or an attendee at our conference, you should feel empathy from our team. That's an obligation, not an option. Um, and the same is true of managers. So we're really explicit with people around the fact that psychological safety is something that we are actively building, that we expect of everyone here. And so we spent a lot of time, we actually, in the past year, have spent a lot more time going back to the basics of emotional intelligence and psychological safety, how you create feedback. And we've actually asked all of our senior managers. So one of the things we've been talking a lot about, my colleague Louisa Proctor is here. She runs our L&D team. And as a people ops leadership team, we've been talking a little bit about there's this assumption that new managers need training and that veteran managers are good to go. And I actually think veteran managers get uh, into habits that are equally unhelpful. And so one of the things we're actually doing is removing the stigma attached to being a new manager and instead saying being a manager is a journey, regardless of whether you've been managing people for 20 years or 20 days. 
And so rather than saying new managers need help and veteran managers don't, instead let's assume that all managers need help and that all of us need to revisit anything we're doing at a given day, myself included, and make sure that we're living examined lives as people managers and treating it with the associated responsibility it deserves. So talk to me about how you collect information when there's a problem. Mm -hmm. Um, what are your avenues for ensuring that there is psychological safety, clear paths for reporting um, that encourage people to come forward so that you can get at the root of things? Great question. So uh, we do the survey, but I will fully admit that the survey is anonymous, but you can imagine there are cultural norms and there are also team norms that differentiate how comfortable you might feel sharing that. So one of the things we do every time we send out the survey is we actually share the norms. So people who are new don't have to turn to someone and go, is this really anonymous? We share all the norms. Here's what will be shared. Here's what you should know. Here's how we anonymize your gender data or your tenure data or whatever the case may be. Uh, but that's necessary but not sufficient. I think we have more to do. So one of the things I'm most proud of is over the past few years, we've really be built out a very strong our business partner organization and one of the things they're responsible for doing is raising feedback that falls within the cracks and oftentimes that's people who either don't feel comfortable speaking up don't necessarily want to do so in a survey uh, we also do things like sharing exit interview survey it, survey data in aggregate. So for example, our diversity and inclusion muscle group this year is gonna hear all the aggregate feedback we heard from exit interviews from underrepresented minority employees. So we will not share anything that says this person, this team, this anything. But it's really important that we hear those themes because honestly they're very personal and exactly to your point on the paper cuts, oftentimes it's a series of paper cuts. So one of the things we're trying to do is drive empathy and awareness of here are the things people experience that we want to meaningfully change. We're not going to share the name, we're not going to share the manager, we're not going to share the team. Instead, let's assume that this is happening everywhere in our business and how can we meaningfully improve on it. So just asking isn't enough. We need to be in the business and one of the other things that I encourage our team to do is uh, HR has a tendency to be off kind of in a separate area of the office not ingrained in the business it's not enough for us to know the business and the metrics we run on we actually have to sit with the teams and see what's happening on the floor so if you're our HR business partner for sales I want to see you on the floor every once in a while I don't want to see you at your desk all the time waiting for people to come to you because some of the worst behavior in organizations we know happens when no one from HR is conveniently sitting in their office um, and so one of the things I want our team to do is be seeing the things that no one's saying and actually coming back and feeding that data to us as well. I want to back up for a minute. I love this term you use, your diversity and inclusion muscle team. Yes. Talk to me about that phrase. So uh, we have an expert. We have a lot of weird expressions at HubSpot, as I think most tech companies do. Uh, but the idea of a muscle group, for lack of a better word, is essentially that we're using it to exert the muscles in the organization that help us move. Um, and so this group, cross-team muscle groups, there are muscle groups for roughly four projects at HubSpot, all of which are business critical. Diversity and inclusion is one of them. But the idea is we appoint a leader. In this case, it's myself, our COO, and our head of corp and business development. And and our job is basically to get the right people in the room and make sure that that organization is highly functioning, highly impactful, and with a bias for action. So we publish monthly reports after each of our meetings. We have people responsible for, we have, you know, everyone signs up for a task force. You are held really accountable to make sure that that muscle group is moving the organization forward. And we, part of the reason why we use muscle group is the notion of a committee it feels very outdated. It feels like you get appointed to it. It also feels like you get lifetime tenure. <laughs> and we don't believe in that. And so the muscle group is very explicitly created to drive the organization forward. The second it is not driving the organization forward, it's my job to switch the people on it, it's remit, how we're reporting out to the organization or whatever the case may be. Um, and so I like the term muscle group, it keeps the bias for action going. Um, and I also like that we're obligated to report out to the organization on a regular basis because it holds me accountable too. So this suggests to me, and it's revealing to me, um, the deeper ways that pe being the chief people at officer is not being a subset of HR and it's not only about um, hiring, retention, promotion, and separating from individuals, that you're much more integral to managing the organization. What does the leadership team look like? Where do you fall in the hierarchy and how do you meet with the other leaders of the organization? 
So my least favorite expression in HR is getting a seat at the table. My so one of the things I noticed when I transitioned to HR is everyone's like, how do you get a seat at the table? Good luck switching into HR. You need to get a seat at the table. You'll never get a seat at the table. Um, and one of the things, so when I was at MIT, Jack Welch was still teaching here. And I know he's uh, an imperfect human being, but I have a real soft spot for him. Uh, and he has a real soft spot for HR and always has. And so one of the things he would always say is, you as a CEO have an obligation to create space for human potential. And obviously, what they did in the talent space was really innovative at the time at GE. Um, and so that always got stuck in my head. And so I actually think HR leaders need to reframe. No one gives you a seat at the table. You earn a seat at the table. And by the way, there are good reasons that HR in some ways has been relegated to the sidelines because they haven't known the business. They haven't been able to drive a proactive conversation. With that said, there are also really bad reasons that executives have kept HR on the sidelines. And you see the evidence of that in you know too many corporate scandals to count. So I'm not taking executives off the hook on this whatsoever. Uh, but one of the things I always remind people, so two of the things that I think about as my frame. Uh, one is the second as an HR leader, you start saying no. So one of my friends has uh, a toddler, and a pediatrician gave her a great piece of advice, which is there are actually only a certain number of times you can say no in a given day before you just start to lose your mind. And so in as much as that was advice for a toddler, I try and take it myself. The second I become the no please and people start picturing me with a finger wagging and like a librarian who's getting you in trouble, I've lost the trust in my team. And to be honest, it's also just not that fun to come to work. Right. It's really not. And I've felt myself doing it sometimes when we're in the middle of something or when we're miserable. And so one of the things I do is go, how many times did I say no today? And sometimes I shake myself at night and go, OK, you know what? You're getting a little too in the no camp. How can we get people back in the yes camp? How do you can you use other stakeholders to help drive this conversation forward? And how do you create other champions? So on diversity and inclusion, one of the things I noticed six months ago was people were starting to tune me out. It's one of the things that gets me up in the morning. I care deeply about it. But by the way, I was also one of the only women early on in the management team. and so. It's personal for me, for sure. But as a result, I've been saying the same thing for three years. And people in the organization were starting to tune me out, and so were my peers and leadership. Uh, and so I went to two straight white men I deeply admire on our management team and said, I need you to do more. And here's specifically what I ask of you. Here are the three things I would ask of you. One of them took over the Women at HubSpot resource group. So um, our VP of Engineering is the co-sponsor of our Women's Employee Resource Group and is doing an incredible job of it. I think men need to be a much bigger part of the gender equality conversation, so I love that it's co-led by our female CFO and our male head of engineering. Uh, and then the other gentleman took over our People of Color at HubSpot Group, and he's been a huge ally and a voice in the room and had a transformative personal experience. And so when you find yourself saying no too much, I think you have an obligation to also go, okay, who else can I rely upon? Uh, the second thing I would say is that the survey data and the structure of HubSpot with the commitment that we've made externally to culture makes it very easy for me to have a conversation in the room with my peers. The other thing that I try and do is really add value. So one of the interesting conversations I've had with other CPOs is who plays the role at making your management team effective? And so part of the thing that I'm really cognizant of is part of my role is coaching my peers. And how do I coach my peers and in the same way ask them to coach me and get that feedback on a regular basis? So uh, one of the things that I try and do once a year is I ask my team and everyone who works with me for basic start, stop, continue feedback. And I publish it to the entire company. And I publish it to my whole team because basically I want to set the standard that the second you join the management team, you are not immune from feedback and growth and needing to continue to improve. And so that way, if everyone on our team, you can imagine we have some young people on our team who are like, I've learned everything I possibly can in this role. I can't learn anything more. I always say to people, that's completely impossible. And partially, we're setting the tone on the top for that. It also sounds like you're setting a tone for yourself and then for the other people for whom you're a role model, to switch from, when I think of when I said no all the time, all day, every day at work, I was being a dutiful bureaucrat. Mm -hmm. And when I got to switch into, both because of opportunity and hopefully a change in headset, where I could say, and yes, and how, and yes. what do we need to know to make something possible, it fundamentally changes the way that you're operating, and hopefully your operation, from going from being, this is how we've always done it, to what can we do that's new and continue to succeed. And empathy is a big part of that. What are, how are you bringing empathy into your day-to-day -day conversations so that it can have a ripple effect within the organization? So first things first, one of our core tenants as a people ops team is that the human part of human resources has been lost somewhere along the way. And so part of what we do is say, forget candidates, forget 
employees, forget alumni, forget all the various audiences and the monikers we use to describe them. Fundamentally, we're trying to create a great place for human beings to do amazing work. Um, and so when you come down to that, it means we have to get the human touches right. And so we have to be there as much for people when they get a promotion as when they're going through a difficult time. We want our medical leave process to be uh, incredibly humane because that is the vulnerable moment where you really need our team most and where you expect us to act with the most most empathy. Um, and so a few things that we do, one of the things we do as our people ops leadership team is infuse empathy into our interview process. We ask people explicitly, how would you handle a situation where um, an employee is requesting a medical leave and the manager wants to do X, Y, and Z? Walk me through how you would actually handle that. And actually, I'm going to play the employee. Walk me through how you would do that uh, because we want empathy to be a big part of our brand. The other thing that we've done, I think, a better job of this year is making sure that we, so uh, human resources teams tend to be the cobbler's children. We are often solving other people's problems, and as a result, we don't spend the time and energy on ourselves. Uh, and I will fully admit that for my first year as CPO, I was running so fast that I ran myself into the ground, and I was running my team into the ground. Um, so I was so focused on getting the human experience right that I forgot to be more human myself, and I also forgot for my colleagues to create space for us to have that conversation. So one of the things I'm most grateful for is in the last year, we've had a lot of tough conversations where people have said to me and felt comfortable saying to me, hey, when you're running a million miles per hour and sending emails late at night and always sending emails, so uh, the worst feedback I, I have gotten in my current role uh, was from a young mom on our team. And she said, when you send me an email on Saturday mornings, you sometimes ruin my time at the park with my son. And I was like, well, thanks for the feedback. That was great. And But I so appreciated her saying it that way because it wasn't, hey, don't send me weekend emails. It was like, hey, when you send it to me at that time, it really throws off my time with my son. And that's such valuable time for me as a human being. And so for me, that was all I needed to hear because it really added that human connection. And I was like, you won't have to tell me again. You won't get another email from me again on a Saturday morning. Um, and so really shaping the behavior that we embody as leaders and how do we hold each other accountable. So I think one nice thing that we've added to our leaders team meetings is we do a check-in. So we are doing programming with the Energy Project. We do a check-in where we just ask, how are you feeling and who will you ask for help when you need it? And humanizing that experience for HR leaders. We have VPs and directors sharing that on a regular basis. I think it's been a really nice thing for our team too. And I'm really grateful that I have a team willing and courageous enough to share that kind of feedback. I want to go back to something that you mentioned earlier about how you've created more diversity um, and more sensitivity to um, meeting people's needs mm -hmm. and um, by tapping into hospitality. So we know that HR and hospitality are um, fields where there happen to be more women than in other areas of business. So to what degree is that the reason why you've had the gain in women at HubSpot? Or is it because of all these other efforts you're making to create a more inclusive and humane culture? So uh, I'm very proud. We have an incredible team of female leaders on our people operations team at HubSpot, and our leadership team is very heavily female. But if we're going to create a great company for women to work in, it can't just be in teams and industries where historically there's a disproportionate percentage of women. Uh, and the other thing I would just say is most tech diversity initiatives are very focused on white women and specifically educated white women. Um, and so one of the things we have to be cognizant of as an organization is, one, we really have to keep an eye on gender and underrepresented teams, specifically sales, our IT team, and our core engineering team. Uh, two, we have to be thoughtful around conversations around gender uh, by market. So what it means to be a female leader differs wildly in many of our different locations. Um, and then three, we have to make sure that people aren't using pipeline as an excuse or a crutch not to do the hard work that we set out to do. So when people tell me that diversity is a pipeline problem in tech, one of the things that I say to them is, did you, if you, if you signed up to work in tech, chances are you love solving hard, virtually impossible problems. And so saying when it comes to people that you cannot solve those impossible problems is a crutch, and it's ridiculous. If you, are gravitate, if you gravitate towards tech, you have a passion for solving the impossible, this should be an exciting challenge to you. And the other thing I really rail against is people call diversity a problem. It's a problem in tech, and that becomes very easy to distance yourself emotionally. Instead, I think about it as it's a business challenge and a human challenge. 
if you rally around that with some positive energy, there's nothing you can't solve and fix, but it requires not just thinking about that from an automation and technical perspective, it requires tapping into your deepest humanity and the kind of world and teams we wanna create. Uh, it turns out that last part is really hard for people who work in tech, and so we're chiseling away at some of that armor, and I think our company is better off for it, I think our customers are better off for it, and I think our software is better off for it. Um, talk to me a little bit about Bring it now down to what you do with individuals, especially with all this hospitality talent on your team. Um, <laughs> if one of the challenges is how do you make every day when you go to work pleasant? How do you make the experiences of coming and going through the stages of your life not just bearable, but actually supported and joyous or understood even when they're not positive? How are you bringing that into the workplace day to day? So I'm so glad you asked this question. Uh, there's a great, I think it's a New York Times article right now out around um, the fallacy of like work as joyous all the time and basically all these young people saying like, it's amazing all the time and one of the things that always cracks me up uh, and cracks Louisa up too is people will come to us and say, we were told this is the best place to work and I had a hard day or I had a hard hour and I wanted to talk to you about it and you can imagine my patience for that is uh, limited at best. But one of the things I always say to people is like, I want to be a best place to work and I want people to rave about their work, but it doesn't mean it's not hard. So the feedback, and you can imagine this is a tried and true lecture I've given many a time. The things that I always say to people is, when you look back at your life and the teams and companies and moments that define your career or your life in some ways, there was hardship, there was some sort of a struggle, there was you know, some sort of sweat equity that you put into a problem or a challenge. So for example, working on our IPO wasn't easy, um, but I learned a lot from the experience. And so the goal is not for, I always say to people too, that just because we have transparency doesn't mean it's a democracy. You're not gonna like every decision that we make that's okay, that's also part of life, that's part of being a part of community, and so my hope is people will not like every decision we make. They won't like every promotion that they don't get, but our goal is to create a culture where they understand the reasoning behind our decisions and we're transparent, honest, and empathetic with how we explain that to people. That doesn't mean it's gonna be a party every day, um, and setting that expectation in a balanced and fair way is really a challenge, because you can imagine there are some people one of our sales managers did a great blog post on LinkedIn where he basically said, if you're joining HubSpot for the perks, you're doing it wrong. The number one reason you should join HubSpot is that we give you interesting problems to work on. The number two is that your peers are incredible and they make you better and they make you smarter and they make you more empathetic. The third thing is whatever perks or whatever other things are important to you, but those two things are paramount and I happen to agree with them. And so um, when we talk about the things that make HubSpot a great place to work, fundamentally you should love the problems you're solving that doesn't mean every day is gonna be easy, that doesn't mean every conversation is gonna be easy, and that doesn't mean it's gonna be all unicorns and rainbows. What it does mean is that you can expect that we will always create an environment that's fair and transparent and hopefully mostly fun. That doesn't mean every hour of every day is gonna be fun. No, because if you don't have the challenge, the win isn't worth it. That's exactly right. Um, we have a few minutes left, so you okay if we open the floor to of some course. questions? Anybody have any questions for Katie? So while we have a kind of sleepy crew, That's okay. I'll ask you one. I, heard, I mean, that just means dinner was really good last yeah, night. Yeah, exactly. Um, one of the things that I remember reading about were little things that hospitality does when people are coming on board to send the message of the kind of environment they're coming into. Can you give me some examples? Yes, uh, so Louisa, is who, who's here with me, she runs our learning and development team, and we are regionalizing our onboarding experience. So we used to bring every single person here to Cambridge. Uh, we are now doing that in our Singapore and our Dublin offices. One of the things that a woman on her team has started doing is creating a personalized video for everyone who starts in APAC to welcome them to HubSpot. So uh, there are several elements on your journey as a candidate that are incredibly nerve-wracking. The interview experience, so everything from what you should wear to how to prepare. We've created blog content on all that. That stuff so you shouldn't have to guess it's all on the internet you don't have to awkwardly a ask a recruiter test. it honestly it's not what we just want to do is make we want to focus on can you do the job everything else what you wear everything else shouldn't be important and so what we want to do is create equalizers in every way shape and form possible 
But the other thing that people underestimate is how nervous people get for the first day of school or first day of their job. And it's like this human thing. I, all of us have it, and yet at the same time, no one wants to talk about it. Everyone's like, oh yeah, I'm gonna crush it on my first day. Everyone's awkward. Everyone feels awkward walking in. No one knows what to wear. And so these personalized videos really welcome people individually. They say your role. They say how excited we are to have. They say one of the things we were excited about from your interview process when we welcomed you in. And so those little personal touches just allow someone the night before, imagine showing your family, hey, this is the place I'm joining tomorrow, and this is the trainer who's going to be meeting with me, and this is what she said about, I would be so proud to show that to someone, whether it's your roommate, uh, your significant other, your children, you know, whatever the case may be. Uh, I love that we're adding personal touches that way. The other thing we try and do is pay attention to people when they're with us. So when people did fly in for new hire training, that's a long time to be away from your family. And so if we heard someone say, I'm really missing this Irish dish, or I really wish we could do this, we try and respond to that because it really shows people we care during moments when they're starting to feel a little defeated or down. Um, and so one of the things we did last holiday season was we allowed employees to share little things with us. So what's something that would make someone on supports day? If they're a diehard Red Sox fan, is there something really small that we could do? And those little moments of delight and crowdsourcing those made a huge difference. And I think we did that for about 70 employees. And it makes a really big difference to feel understood at work. And those gifts were usually under $40, it wasn't a huge expense, but also it set the tone for our team that asking to do little things can be as important as really big things. Katie, I think that's a wonderful way to kind of pull this to a close, which is that by creating these systems and this culture where you see people for who the, their real talent within, and you create an environment where people can feel seen and heard, understood and respected, it creates the precondition for an inclusive environment that can go and do great work even when it's hard. That's the goal. And I would also just say that like we are figuring it out every day. And so there are days when it feels like we're getting it completely right. And there are days when it feels like, gosh, are we swinging and missing here? And I think one of the things I like about our team is that commitment to fairness and respect makes it easy to make hard decisions. So if we're making a decision on a medical leave or a promotion or a termination, we come back to, can we sleep at night if we make this decision? And is it creating a human-centric company? By the way, sometimes people will say to us, well, it's not a human-centric company if you're terminating me. And what I always say to people is sometimes the job you leave is the best possible decision to impact the rest of your life. And by the way, keeping someone in a job where they won't be successful is not actually the right thing to do for either the human or the company. Now, what you can expect from us is that we do it fairly, clearly, that we treat you fairly on the way out. Those are all fair, but that doesn't mean, again, that we keep people around. So we'll have first-time managers who you can imagine are like, well, we said we were running a human-centered company and we're best place to work. This is going to be hard or this person isn't going to be happy. Again, the role is not democracy. The role instead is to figure out how we create that condition of fairness and respect and use that as a guidepost for all of our decisions. So that then the people who are there are thriving, are proud, uh, excited to come to work and proud to talk about it when they meet other people. That's exactly right. Well, Katie, thank you so much for sharing all of it with us, and thank you.